Okay, this one's a little impromptu. I wasn't planning to get on and do any kind of recording today. Today was about doing photo and video editing from my amazing take from my travels, so many great images, and I was in the process of doing that work when I started to feel not very well and decided that lying down and taking a quick rest was probably the thing. While doing that, I, of course, opened up YouTube and started skimming through videos. And it struck me how there's a suite of topics that seems to be ever more ubiquitous, at least in the waters I swim in. Um, <laughs> and it does seem to become, it be becoming an ever more prevalent discussion about gender in the sense of what is a woman? What is real masculinity? How do we balance this, these elements within ourselves? How do we bring the sexes back together? And that last part is very dear to my heart. I'm, I'm very sad to see humanity divided, square down the middle that way. That seems a big rift. We have to start working to heal sooner than later if we're going to have any kind of united front with which to stand up and represent our own best interests and stand against the bullshit that we used to be appropriately intolerant of. Being intolerant is a natural, biological essential. You, you're intolerant of things that are poisonous or damaging. That's good. You, you need a certain amount of intolerance to know what stays out. And being just, let's say, toxically tolerant has gotten us into some pretty weird quagmires. The things that are up for debate these days, um, I think, are, are evidence of how far off course we've come. And <clears throat> I am fascinated by this discussion. It really does seem one of the more critical issues at hand that we are at odds with ourselves and each other in such a fundamental way, in a way that what is lost is, is, it's so big to lose that magic that happens in the complement between the masculine and the feminine, whether it's within us as individuals trying to balance our traits, or even more so when we come to go together as people, as man and woman, and, and what is possible there when we approach it soundly. And <sighs> it's, it's definitely worth a discussion or several but what i'm finding as i'm listening is that just as we like to complicate simple things we we tend to oversimplify complex things and when it comes to saying what women are and want okay that's that how do you say that there's a whole spectrum of of people who are women there's a whole spectrum of people who are men and being at one point or another on that spectrum doesn't necessarily make you more or less a, a man or a woman. Um, and I don't think that we could, we can, we can certainly make generalizations for any number of reasons, but when you're talking about whether or not one person and one person coming together in an in intimate relationship are going to be on point, <laughs> it, you need you need finer gradations. You need you need to know that it's it's more about finding the balance between those individuals coming in from wherever they are. Um, and so, I've been listening about I've been listening to a lot of people from from both sides of the aisle on how to be in your feminine energy or how to be in your masculine energy, and I think it's important that we do give this thought, but I also think we need to go a little deeper with it than what I'm hearing. It, I, I heard one woman really, I'm sure she's coming from a good place and she means well, and I'm not inclined to argue with a lot of the points she made. I just think it's very top, it's very surface, and that what needs attention is a little bit deeper than that. Um, now, maybe I have to tell a little bit about myself. I personally 
tend to be very balanced between my masculine and feminine traits in terms of just an overall evaluation. I've got almost 50-50 working for me, and I'm glad of that. I'm very grateful for that, ultimately. Um, going back to the beginning, my mother told me the story of being pregnant and asking my father, do you want a boy or a girl? I thought about it a minute and said, I don't really care, but I know what to do for a boy because he had much younger brothers and he played a role as like a, an uncle or a father at times. And so he's familiar. He was familiar with what to do with a, a young guy. Um, and I think this was evidenced in the fact that I never felt that he had any problem with me being a girl. He just brought what he knew as, as you know, big brother, what had he done that worked with his brothers? He brought that to me and I feel blessed because that gave me a lot of knowledge and skills and insights I might not otherwise have. I felt like his desire to make sure I could do basic things in life. I understood basic things. I, I had a grasp of logic and philosophy that he would challenge me. He didn't treat me like a little cupcake princess. He would he would set the bar a little bit above my reach and then, you know, encourage me to get on tippy toe and, and reach a little further. And then, of course, th there was the reward of just achieving more than I thought I could. And then the positive feedback of him saying, out of way, you got it. And I, I really, I like that I had that. I don't think I appreciated that in some way my father raised me as a son and my mother raised me as a daughter, but I thought that was pretty fabulous. E years on, looking back at it, I'm like, I made out pretty well with that because it, it does give me these dual, at least these dual aspects, probably many more under the two big headings. Um, that at various times I've needed to be able to draw on both. And just as we need to be able to change our, our state and, and shift between roles in life as we are at work is not how we are with our intimate partners, is not how we are with our family members. It, you need to be able to rotate through these and know which aspect is appropriate in which context. And I've, I've been able to have a full complement, this wide array of aspects to draw from in life very much in the same way. When is it important for me to draw on these more masculine elements? When is it more beneficial to, to call on my more fem feminine elements? And um, I think I've always been like, the <laughs> as a little girl, I would get dressed up in a pretty dress that I could like spin around and dance in. I have my white tights and my shiny shoes. And I would go out and I would dig up salamanders and climb trees and skip rocks, like dress this way. And that really kind of has never gone away. I like being a girl. Well, not a, haven't been a girl in a while, but I like, I like being in my feminine aspect. And I like having those more masculine interests and drives and abilities. And that's been there from the start. It was also reinforced later on in school when the the intrigue, the political intrigue around the girls' social circles left me kind of at a loss. I never quite cracked the code. I never found my way in. I don't know if there was an in to be had, honestly. It was, it always felt like a shell game to me. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it was rigged and I wasn't going to win. And at some point I remembered sort of almost coming to despair. I was, I finally had like a, a friend I was hanging out with on the regular and I was like, this is great. And then two girls came along and kind of took her off of me and were like, yeah, you're not welcome now. I was like, okay, back to zero. <laughs> and so I kind of was lo at a loss and I started wandering around the playground and I just happened upon some, some guys like under one of the jungle gyms playing with their action figures. And I was, I was into Voltron and you know, Transformers and G.I. Joe, and it was a hodgepodge of action figures, and they were making up their own scenarios, and 
I noticed they had like the complete Voltron and I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, oh, I don't have those. And they're like, oh, you like Voltron? I was like, yeah. They're like, you should bring your action figures and play. I was like, oh, I, I don't have them with me. They're like, well, you want to play with us? I was like, yeah, sure. And it was so simple and so fun and there was no code to crack and there was no intrigue. It was just, you know, bashing around with the guys, having a good time, and it was such a relief to me. I realized how much I enjoyed that, and I don't know. I mean, they didn't get to be my long-term social circle, but it was nice to know that there was something simple about that I could just fall in on, and it was just having shared interests, and it was great. And then puberty happened, and all that got complicated. But up to this point in my life, through these formative chapters, I realized that there were a lot of things about having the two aspects that really gave me options in life and that carried forth in a lot of ways. I, I, I am an outlier. I do like mechanical things. I like ideas. I like, I don't know, I, I like body humor. I, <laughs> there are things I like in that, that domain that are not as readily come by in the female domain, right? It's not necessarily as as prevalent there. And I've definitely met some girls who are, you know, they have a body sense of humor or they happen to really enjoy engineering and technology or they're very cerebral and they love to explore ideas. And I love that. I love when I meet women who can bring that. That's That's one of my favorites, but it's rare. And so I've realized, I'm like, okay, you're, you're on a certain point of that spectrum. You're, you're an outlier there. And that's okay. Um, I, I, I don't mind being a little bit alone if I get to have that wonderful, rich balance and be at the center in another sense where I kind of, I draw from both sides. Drawing from both sides at the center puts me at the end of a spectrum, right? <laughs> it's both are true. Um, and so I've been kind of exploring this most of my life, trying to figure out how to fit this in. But like anything else, you kind of have to figure out when to be your 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 funny self with friends and your attentive self with a partner and your respectful self with elders or whatever it is, you learn to move through that. And um I don't know, eventually you take it for granted. You don't really struggle with it as much. You don't think about it as much. You kind of get your, your routine worked out and or your rotations, whatever it is. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I eventually felt like I'd come into balance with that and it didn't seem to be a big topic for anyone else until recently. I would say back when the culture wars really started heating up, was that 2012-ish, I, I seem to remember, and by like 2015, it was it was ever more evident that this was gonna be a thing for a minute, and um, gender identity and the politics around that and everything that has stemmed from that um, has become ever more a hot topic. Uh, and a point of focus for us. And that brought back a lot for me because I was like, oh yeah, I went through this personally and now we're kind of going through this culturally that we had to figure out what all this is and where it fits and what's, what are the pros and cons and how do we strike the balance. And so I actually got pretty excited when I first realized these conversations were, were taking place here, there, in the third place. And now it seems it's almost all around me. Um, and again, that might be the algorithm sees what I'm I'm watching and feeds it to me, um, but I, I do think it really is ever more um, a hot topic itself, or a suite of topics um, <clears throat> around sex and gender and and balancing these things within ourselves and and amongst us. Um, so I have been listening. I have been paying attention to what people have to say, but as I listen. The growing concern I have is our tendency to overgeneralize. Being able to generalize is a useful tool, and when applied to the right job, you get the good results. But I don't think it's the best tool for the job of discussing these subjects because 
it's a much more individual and nuanced matter than to say women are like this and women want this or men are like this and men want this. While there are things we can generalize about and there do tend to be tendencies, right? I, I just don't think it's helpful to say women are like this, men are like this, and here's what we need to do collectively. Um, I'm afraid of where that comes out, frankly. I've seen things swinging in a certain direction and I, I have been concerned for what that backlash could look like and an ultra conservative regressive movement toward traditional ways without accounting for the ways in which the world has changed and how that has changed us is dangerously naive. Um, these issues really call for a, a certain amount of nuance and we need to account for the fact that none of us are just what we are by one demographic measure. While it's essential to see the ways in which we are so much alike as humans, there's so much commonality that binds us together in the human experience, but we all come with different interests, different proclivities, different strengths and shortcomings, we like different flavors, we have different kinks, we have whatever it is where we are in in so many other regards unique, where we're this happenstance of traits that came together in this way and you really lose so much of what is beautiful and fascinating and true about humanity when we we start to overgeneralize and so I feel that that's one of the more perilous aspects of the conversations I hear taking place around these subjects and how do I put this everything I have to say is paradoxical today okay I'm saying you need to be able to generalize in many regards and see the commonalities um, and I'm also saying <laughs> You need to get a little more specific and, and see what is unique about individuals. Uh, so you got to really realize what level you're working at. Are we, we looking at um, statistical models at like an epidemiological level? And we need to generalize. We need to say, yes, there is clearly on the whole a difference between men and women in, in our, our physicality, in our emotional and intellectual composition, in our interests, our drives how we experience things. There are, there are differences, certainly. Um, and, and honoring those differences and bringing them together in a complement is what makes us an amazing powerhouse of a species. None of us got here that we didn't figure out how to bring those forces together. There's no way that oh, I can imagine being nine months pregnant in the, the primal environment trying to go out and hunt for myself and fend off predators alone. I can't imagine that. I, I, I know how hard it is just to tie your shoelaces in that state. And so, yeah, it, it was good that men had the strength and the ability to go day in, day out and, and be able to hunt and, and protect a, a pregnant partner and protect that vulnerable life growing inside of her and then to be there to protect and provide for the child that resulted from that and we we wouldn't have been able to make it without men there's this idea that men have always kept us down and yes we've been oppressed women have been oppressed it's the fact it's irrefutable fact but that's not what we're really up against right now and to be carrying on as though that were the case for for at least women in the modern westernized world where we do have a lot of power and freedom and access to resources and legal protections and all these things that yes we really do need because we know how bad it gets when it goes wrong um but but to say you know to talk about the patriarchy what a boogeyman that is that i i don't know it's I have trouble with that concept inside and out. I don't think there is a patriarchy. And I grew up when it was still really kind of a man's world. It really was. And 
I have a view of that and I saw some of the darker aspects of that and it yeah, it made an impression but on the whole I I don't think that's really a thing at all first of all because I don't know if men would bother to get up and run the world if it weren't for women this is another thing we forget our power over men that's that's something we seem to miss somehow it turned into like the male gaze being a horrible thing like that's what got them up to go to work <laughs> like that's what got them out there to you know to hunt the the big game back in the day when we really needed each other and and men needed a reason to do it frankly like that's that's part of this too is the interdependence men could not keep the human race going they couldn't keep <clears throat> peace in the tribe they couldn't find the other arrowhead without us <laughs> you know this is the thing about it they couldn't come home to us having found the best berries in season and you know the leather chewed and the fires going they wouldn't have that they would be a harsh existence for them and they'd probably turn on each other and like <laughs> it would be a bad scene right so we have had this interdependent relationship between the sexes since the dawn of time that's allowed us to be the formidable species we are, the presence we are in this world. It's not because of our, our fierce fangs and deadly claws. Like, it's not our tough hides or our mass or our speed. We don't have those things. We have our, our intelligence and our, our social skills and our ability to come together. And none of this is without that. And I think we forget our origins, and, and I think talking about the patriarchy keeping women down is a little disrespectful of what it is men have done for humanity. And I think it diminishes the power that women have innately, innately. We are, we, we make all the life, we make all the humans, like, we, we have incredible powers in, in being women that baffle and terrify men. Men are like mystified and afraid of women as much as anything. And you can see it like what's going on today that, you know, I mean, men are afraid to say the wrong word. They don't know whether to hold the door or not to. They're, they're <laughs> I feel bad for the guys, frankly, because, well, here's the thing. I think that women get to make all the people and and to have incredible influence in almost everything we do and men don't get to bring forth life and and nurture it and create a home and have this magical power over us in in the same way what they have is a sense of purpose and and we play a big role in that and that is part of the feminine power is to to bolster the men to go out and do the hard work to take the risks to to work tirelessly to to provide for and protect the the family and maybe the whole tribe if possible um and i think talking about people being high value is a little i, I think it's a little trashy i don't know like everybody's got a value everybody has something to contribute and making, yes, we have to consider the influence of hierarchy, and yeah, this is a factor, but we all need each other. There isn't one's better than the other, right? And, and, and there's not one way of being a man or one way of being a woman. I think it was Alan Watts was invited to be part of a think tank when genetics became a, a burgeoning science and they said if we can start to tinker with our genes and create the perfect man who what would that be perfect human I guess was the idea but what would the perfect man be and Alan Watts's answer was that you need all of the people you need all the kinds of people because you never know who who's going to be needed for the, the job at hand, right? And different people are going to bring different skills and we need to have a little more of a sense of appreciation and value for that. And um, I think I think in talking about like, oh, being this kind of person makes you high value, it, 
it looks a little silly to me. It looks like kids playing dress up, like trying to like play a role instead of actually finding out what their gift is and devoting themselves to bringing that into the world for themselves and those around them. And that's, that's, you know, in a sense, I, I would talked a little bit about self-actualization and that's about finding your purpose and living it and, and really being fully who you are. And these ideas kind of push against that in some way. I think they're, they're infantilizing. They, they, they really kind of push us down to the level of playing dress up and posturing. And that's not what it is. That's, that's not what it's about. And yes, I do like to appear feminine and I do like to present as feminine. I, I value my feminine aspects and, and the power and the skill that lies in those. Um, but I also know I, I need and value my masculine aspects and that I couldn't imagine saying this aspect is a value and this one's not. They all play a role and that's true within me and it's true in the world. We need all the people to be able to come and step up and play their role as who they are with the gifts they actually have to bring. And I think that's some of us feeling lost right now too, is we used to be, well, we were born to a trade. We would learn what our, our father's trade was and do it, or we'd follow our mothers around and learn how to run a household and, and raise children. And, you know, it, it, maybe it was kind of constrictive in a way, and I'm not proposing we go back to that, but our sense of role and purpose and place was very clearly defined, and now it's anyone's guess. And I think that's some of the distress we see. And I think talking in these terms is only exacerbating that condition, ultimately. Um, we really do need all kinds of people, and we really have all kinds of people. People come in, in all the diff with all the different combinations, and that's what completes the whole picture for us. That's what makes it all possible. We really do need that, and, and that's why I think integrating these, these elements was important to me personally, but I hear it's it's actually getting a lot of traction with others, and it's it's a growing area of interest, and um, I'm thrilled by that. But I also think we need to proceed with caution, lest we do more harm than good. Um, but back to the question of what level we're looking at, whether we're looking in in a broad way at. Um, the things we can generalize, the differences that are real, um, the, the things that we do tend to, where we do tend to differ between the sexes. Being able to talk about that is, is very important, and from a broad view, that is a, a useful discussion. But when we start coming down to people giving each other guidance about how to be a man or be a woman, I think we have to realize we're, we're working at a different scale and there are different considerations. And here it's much finer. You, you need the, the fine adjustments to really get a clear focus on what that's about. And um, you, you can't know, you can't know what each individual has to offer, what they need, what they want, based simply on whether they're a man or a woman. And so we've got to look for the truth at that, that sweet spot. On the golden mean, you've got to find the sweet spot. And it's, it's rarely at the middle or either end. It's, it's, it's just teasing out quite more specifically where it is. And it's fairly individual. We all come from different backgrounds with different cultural influences, different ideas, different values, beliefs, different aspects within ourselves that are, are stronger or not as developed and so it's it's vital that we can actually move between generalizations and a, a finer degree of specificity and know where we're working from and I just worry that some of these conversations are too general because it does it takes all kinds and we got all kinds and it's there's no one size fits all kind of 
solution to this. It really isn't. And I'm more interested in finding what is universal that we can all get around. And I think that there are essential things. And I, I feel a little bad doing this because I know the men only have so much room to talk about their issues and and explore what it is they're trying to tease out for themselves in, in the question of what is a man, what does it mean to be masculine. And Chris Williamson had a, a great answer to this question on um, impact theory with Tom Bilyeu. And he, he was asked what, what it means to be a real man. And he acknowledged that this is difficult to start with. It, it's, it's hard to find ground to stand on with this question as a modern man. Um, but he said it, it has to do with integrity, telling the truth, courage, bravery. And Tom interjected and asked for him to define integrity. And let's see if I can read my own handwriting. He said, Chris said, your actions and your words aligning, the things you say you're going to do and the things you actually do. The things that you do in public and the things that you do in private. The things you do when nobody is watching and the things that you do when you're on a stage. The alignment of essence and action would be a good way to get started with integrity. Essence and action. I love that. Like, such a great answer. Um, I think that's what I'm trying to get to. And again, I know this is about masculinity and I'm not trying to show up as a woman and be like, that's true for women too. Sorry, I'm really not trying to do that, but zoom out just a little bit and you realize that this this does apply. This is it is one of my core values. Integrity is way high on my list to try and be consistent with what I value, what I intend to do, how I really want to be living my life and how I go about doing that. And it it does. It does mean doing it when nobody's looking. It does mean doing it when there's more punishment than reward. It, it means doing it because it is the value and it is at, at the heart of your own essence and living in alignment with it, right? And aligning with our essence is probably the, the broader conversation that we need to have. We do need to branch off a little bit and do some boy-girl kind of groupings so that we can get to the heart of what the essence is in that regard. Um, but I, I do think there's there's a, a, a common area where we can meet up and explore what that means as humans, collectively. And I would definitely put integrity way high on the top of that list of things that if we could reinvigorate certain values, maybe not go back to the old ways, but maybe resurrect some of the old values and and you know believe in the virtue of virtues again, because I think I'm all for skepticism, but I think we've gotten a little too cynical and, and jaded about these things. And I can appreciate how that came about. I remember back in the 80s, it had gotten pretty saccharine. And I don't know, it was, it, it was disheartening that all the heroes were kind of the same type. And it, it, it felt flimsy and phony. And it was easy to turn against it, especially as ever more scandals would come to light about people and you know folks would lose faith in their heroes and faith in the system and, and the system's been crumbling for a long time and, and losing faith in that is probably wise but but having a reasonable response of, of despairing in the the power of heroes and systems to save us um, and and just going completely floppy there's a lot of ground in between the two right <laughs> there there's a lot between saying okay we maybe the action hero is not coming to save us and maybe the government doesn't have all the answers but that doesn't mean we just lie down and go passive we we still have to find something to rally around something to honor something to serve and I don't think we're well if we don't have that which has me like questioning whether I should go anywhere near the topic of religion right now um, without getting deep on the topic of religion I do think that there is something that we seek you, you look at human history and 
find me one where people weren't trying to look through the veil and see what what's beyond us, what's larger than us, where did we come from, who made all of this, right? And we, we've had rituals and we've used symbols forever. It's, it, it, it goes so far back. You look at ancient burial sites of early hominids putting objects in the graves and it shows you there's some sort of understanding of something, maybe not quite religious, but, but an understanding that there's something larger, that there's a power, there's a symbol, a symbolism in, in that act that speaks to something that we don't have words for. And we're all drawn to that in some way, at some level. Even, even hardcore atheists at some point have wrestled with these questions, with these instincts. And yeah, I think that we need to feel that there's something larger and that we are part of it and that we are aligned with it and that we serve it in some way. And, and you know, it, not in a, a self-sacrificing way, not that I, I don't see the value in self-flagellation or martyrdom or it's not at that extreme, but in the way that we have a sense of purpose, there's a sense of meaning. We, we gain some sense of fulfillment and a healthy aspect of identity from that because I'll often talk against being identified with things as being its own danger of sorts. If you're too identified with things, you begin to come out of alignment with your own essence and your actions reflect that and the results you get in life reflect that, right? So I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that we do need to feel that we have purpose and we serve something. I, I think that's just inborn and we can't, we can deny it, but we can't shake it, not really. And there's something holy in serving each other. There's something truly beautiful and righteous and fulfilling that comes from putting ourselves in the service of one another and this battle of the sexes idea it's it's not a battle we we don't you don't try to score points on your teammates we're teammates this is this is not the thing and we do have to play our positions or it's going to be chaos on the field and i don't know why i'm using sports analogies i'm not a sports fan but this is this is a basic thing we we all kind of understand at least and yeah, it's, it's about creating a complement between the sexes and between the aspects and finding common ground that we can rally around. So it's, it is, everything I'm talking about is paradoxical. Um, on one hand, we do have to recognize our unique gifts and what we truly are in our own essence, but we also have to understand, this isn't paradoxical, this is just what level you're working at. At a level, a collective level, right? You have to understand how to bring that in the service of the whole that everyone wins. And I think we've gotten into the idea that there's like a zero sum game and that's fundamentally pathological. We, we none of us are that, we, you know, we don't all do our part for this. We don't, I don't know, we don't, we don't build the roads ourselves. Somebody does that, we need them. We don't build the cars. Somebody does that, we need them. We can't get to our jobs to do the things we do if we don't have the cars or the trains or whatever it is, the bicycle that, that gets us there. And um, yeah, it's about integration at every level possible while still recognizing and honoring the differences in general terms and the differences at a more individual and unique level. And so this conversation around what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, yeah, we should have some general guidance. We should have some idea what that means. And I think we have been able to tease out a lot of that. I think we've been able to kind of comb through and say, well, these are, these are the things. And you can kind of just look back to the early days of humankind and see how that worked and understand maybe why it's so. And um, 
I love that. I love, I know it's not hard science, but what is it? Anthropological bi biologists, or I forget what the field is, but they really look at what were the, the environmental and the social influences that probably shaped us into these distinct entities that are man and woman. And yet, I know that that's not, that's not a very high resolution picture of what you're dealing with when you're dealing with a man and a woman, because they're going to come with their own thing. And it's, it's finding how those things fit together. And so I really do hope that as this conversation evolves, we, we can manage to see the different levels of it. And I know that's asking a lot now that we're all conditioned to pick a side, toe the party line and, and, and yell your position as loud as you can. Um, but we got to get over that. We've got to get a little more limber and a little more competent in reasoning through things, which I guess is maybe one of my more masculine aspects showing through. But we we all need a little bit of reason and logic here. We all need to think a little more subtly about these things. And where my feminine aspect comes in is to say that we need to do it with heart, with compassion, with a desire to care for ourselves and each other in a way that we as individuals and as a collective can flourish. And it's my hope that as we continue to explore these questions together, we can not lose sight of the fact that being, what was it Chris Williamson said, um, in alignment with our essence and action, and that we can integrate these aspects within ourselves and we can come together as men and women and find a way to take advantage of how our strengths really do support each other and and set our sights squarely on how we we can really heal and and come back together this we're fragmented we are disintegrated and uh, that's not generally a good state to be in it we're still trying to fight the forces of entropy here. Um, and I, I think that it, it is important that we do identify what it is that is feminine and what is strong in that and what is beautiful in that and what that has to offer and where that may not always be complete unto itself, where that also has needs and and space for the masculine and to do the same from the masculine side to say what is strong and beautiful and of value there and where does it fall short and where does it have room for the feminine because we need to be able to be in our own way and yet leave room for the other that's that's the yin yang it it's always got a drop of the other in it that's that's where the balance is it's not all black and all white it's a little drop of the other in each that says there's an interdependence and an interplay in those those forces and i i love the interplay don't we love the interplay isn't it lovely doesn't it do so many wonderful things we talk about where it goes wrong but we lose sight of of all the the benefits and and the wonder of it and I, that's why it breaks my heart it's not just the the conflict and the suffering it causes it's all the goodness it costs and I want to cash in on the goodness so yeah I hope that we we can sort of reestablish better definitions for ourselves particularly in the modern context which is unlike anything this is completely unexplored territory to live in the 21st century as we do and we have so many other factors in play that we've never been up against before i mean just just take social media we all love to look at social media and be like mm, but that one really does bear an incredible influence because we've never been so inundated with information and 
we've never been able to hear so many voices and and perspectives as we can at like the swipe of a screen from a thing in our pocket that yeah it's it's definitely shaping us and we can't just hit the rewind button and go back to the way things were that won't work but we can make moves toward creating the possibility of more people choosing more traditional roles. I think that's something that's been lost. I think women have been strongly discouraged, particularly by other women, um, from from choosing to be a wife, a mother, a homemaker as their, their primary path in life. And I think you see the breakdown of the household and children in distress and we don't really have communities like we used to have. I think in in the absence of that, you see what functions it it really serves to, to have women who are happy and willing to be in those roles and support them. Don't don't force women into the roles. They don't you don't want kids, you should not have kids. Don't do it. I'll never tell a person who doesn't want children to have children. That's that's terrible for them and the children. Don't don't marry if you don't want to marry. It is work. It's it's a life's work and it can be more profoundly fulfilling than almost anything else. Yes, but you have to want it and you have to be willing to show up and and put in the heart, put in the effort and and you know, forcing people into that. I will always stand against that. However, I think a majority of people might choose that if they were supported in it. And for women who choose to be homemakers, there are things we could do, like allow for certain investment funds that would provide for their retirement. Um, there, there are things we can do to help them strengthen their communities so they really do have a village. And we stop talking about the cost of childcare and we start talking about how to how to build networks of, of neighbors to to look out for each other like we used to do. It used to be the moms looking out the windows knew what was going on while the kids were out free ranging. And then we started structuring childcare and these other artificial systems that it's good to have. It's better that the kids are supervised and guided in some way, but it also has, has strangled childhood out of the human experience in a certain way. I think we talk about resilience and how to make kids more resilient and like, well, let them go out in groups where, yeah, there there are adults around and you can roll up on, on the neighbor's house and knock on the door if there's really a problem. Somebody will be there to handle it. Um, but, you know, for for us growing up, we had to figure stuff out. We had to deal with it. We had to deal with the bullies and the conflicts and the the heartaches and, you know, not getting chosen for the team or whatever it might be. We figured it out and that made us strong. And I think this artificial system that wants everybody to be equal is actually costing kids those experiences that give them the strength and the skill to navigate the adult world independently and effectively and I don't think it's as good as, as having you know a mom shout out the window with like don't make me call your mother <laughs> you know they used to keep some order we forget women were a certain kind of police force right we, we wouldn't we know what was up we make sure hold people to account that's another thing that was lost from the feminine power in, in this move to join the workforce and I'm all for women working. I, I really think that women have so much to bring. We have so much to bring to the workforce, to the market, to the, the collective in terms of developing ideas and creating solutions and I'm so glad that we have moved forward with that. But. I feel we've really thrown out the baby with the bathwater and we've lost a, a lot of what it means to to be in our natural feminine way as, as wives, as mothers, as members of the community who play a role, who have an influence, who have an ear to the ground. Who, yeah, and, and that's really sad. And I think 
it's put us in competition with men in the workforce. And well, this is another interesting thing. It comes up that women who are very successful professionally, who, who make more money than their, their husbands, um, have a higher rate of divorce. And the conversation I keep hearing is around the fact that a man doesn't want to compete with his wife or feel that he's not as successful as her. And I'm sure in some cases that's, that's true. And, um, you know, a, a man's wounded ego is not to be trifled with. Um, there is that. But I also wonder how much it is that trying to be Wonder Woman, we don't have enough hours in the day to provide for our marriages as we need to. We, we don't necessarily have the strength or the attention at the end of the day to, to be nurturing and attentive to our husbands. And men really need that. You can look at the, um, the Gottmans have, have studied relationships, marriages especially, um, for years and they've observed in the laboratory that we make bids, they call it a bid for, um, I don't know if it's attention or engagement, but we reach out and we say, oh, hey, look at that. And successful partnerships, the, 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 the other partner will turn and go, oh, that's really interesting. Whether they care or not, they'll just acknowledge that their, their, their significant other is excited about something and wants to share it with them. And they'll come meet them there and say, oh, yeah, that's great. And the ones that are not so successful, those get by a lot. And it starts to add up to, to feeling neglected and resentful. And that, that puts a big rift in the marriage as well in the relationship whether married or not um and what is it the masters and the disasters the masters pick up on the bids and the disasters don't and i don't know how a woman who's now on a, a 40 to 60 hour work week plus commute is maybe coming home to children and probably the larger share of the domestic responsibilities because in general that still does fall largely to a woman who's now like stretched thin and barely able to take care of herself how is she going to meet her husband's emotional social and sexual needs reliably when she can barely take care of herself under those conditions it's it's not i don't i don't see the progress in that and i'm not surprised the women who are hard driving wildly successful tend to have a higher divorce rate and yeah again maybe maybe it is the competition but I think it's also worth exploring the possibility that there's just not enough human being to go around to fulfill all the roles of being a wife, a, a mother, a homemaker, and, and a professional who may have to commute. And then there's the, the PTA meetings and the family functions and the other things that we feel pressured to be a part of. And it's too much. And I think we have to learn to identify, acknowledge, and honor our limits and that, say there's no shame in that. There are only so many hours in the day and we are finite organisms. And I, I think we're, we're almost too proud to admit that and that's a shame. It really is, it's not necessary and it's not beneficial. I think that so many women would be happy to be able to, in a functional system, in a functional relationship, create a home and a family and and a life around that that that's not setting us back it it's not i i feel like we've inverted the truth of the matter by saying progress is being a wage slave and not having enough of yourself to go around to enjoy or or sustain the things that life's supposed to be about which is people and home and and time to savor those those moments and those connections we share. And yeah, of course we're coming apart at the seams. If it's not one thing, it's another. And um, I'm, I'm sure this is wildly unpopular with the sisterhood, but it's not my sisterhood. They never wanted me anyway. <laughs> mm. But this is, this is for the women, not against them, to say, look, I, I think that there's a, a 
another conversation that needs to happen here around saying, I feel that this is exploiting women. I think it is because we're not, we're not able to enjoy what we create and we're not able to sustain it but we're working just as hard as the men and it seems like for many women they choose not to get married not to have children never to have that experience and uh, you know again Chris Williamson talks about this a great deal I've gotten into his his work quite a bit in in recent months that these topics have been of interest to me because apparently he's been hot on this this topic too and he's had a number of guests on who've, who've provided great insights and I would strongly recommend checking it out if this is of interest to you um, but one of the alarming statistics he rattles off is that 80% of women who are childless never intended to be childless it's just the way it worked out and that there are entire support groups for, for people who did not get to have children who are dealing with this kind of ambient grief over that that lack in their life. And we're not talking about this. We're not being real about this. We're not being honest with ourselves about what the cost of this is. And it's still not clear to me what the gain is. I really don't see it. I, I think that being able to pursue a career is it, it's essential we, we we would lose so much if we said okay women out of the workforce everybody out of the pool that's not an answer i i'm grateful i have the opportunity to work i'm grateful for the work that women have done i'm grateful that the educational opportunities are there there it wasn't long ago these things were not possible it wasn't even that long ago that women weren't full citizens they were they were chattel and they didn't have authority over money or even their own children um, the divorce laws were terrible it it was a mess you needed your husband's permission to get a medical procedure this is not what we want to go back to I'm grateful for this progress but this what is it like boss bitch or whatever <laughs> I don't know what this is. I, I think it's it's making us all sick and it's pulling apart the fabric of civilization as we know it. And I know civilization has changed a lot. I was just saying, being in the 21st century, there are a lot of influences that we've never had to contend with before. But I don't know. There's There's got to be a balance between the modern and the old ways. And I'd like to hope that we can we can focus on finding that balance again and finding our values and getting aligned with that finding our essence and aligning that with our action and yes these are these are the conversations I hope we move on to very quickly as we continue to explore these reasonably complex topics that can't be broken down to a woman is and a man's role is and <laughs> this is what a high value woman or man does or it, it's never going to be that simple humans are, are messy and complicated in that way and we need to account for that and and we need to figure out how we bring us back together because no, the heroes aren't coming for us, and the government doesn't have the answers. We collectively have to all pitch in our own part here and get around exploring what's possible, because <laughs> that's all I can do. I, I'm, I'm not trained in any particular field. I don't have the answers to anything, but I do have a perspective, and I, I hope that by sharing that, that's some small contribution to the collective effort to unravel these these complex and sometimes subtle issues and um, yeah I think that about covers the overview I'm, I'm sure there's a lot I'd like to get into in greater depth but for now these are some of the thoughts that are really popping for me and I'm, I'm happy we're having these discussions and I hope that we can progress to where the real collective ambition is to bring ourselves 
back together and find a better way forward. Well, until we can manage that, we'll keep banging around over here trying to figure stuff out. And as always, I appreciate you coming through to take the ride with me. And I hope that this is of some benefit. All right. Thank you again. All the best.